Welcome church. We would like to extend a warm welcome to our online viewers. Those of you who joined us last week, welcome back again. Thank you for joining our worship service today. We are delighted to have you with us and we look forward to having you with us each week. This series has at heart the youth who may be struggling with the question does God still love me regardless of how I identify myself? This question can cause confusion within our youths, hence the reason why we titled this month, Confused, Why Are You So Confused? We, the leadership team, feel it is important to start having open conversations about sexuality, both at home and in the church. This month's program aims to educate youths, parents, and the church of the social issues youths are facing. We want them to, we want the youths to know that they are not alone and the church and Jesus loves them. I'd also like to introduce our guest speaker for the hour. Uh, Pastor Aki, who is the Family Life Director of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Our headquarters is based in Watford. His responsibilities also include children's ministry and keeping our church family safe. He's a man of God with a quiet and humble nature. 
and he will be blessing blessing us by a he will be blessing us with the message that he will bring from the word of god before he speaks we will have a prayer by brother taddy followed with a special song but lastly i have a few words for us to meditate on before we pray and it is taken from mark 9 verses 23 and it says everything is possible for him who believes everything is possible for him who believes so let us have our prayer now if it's possible let us take relevant positions and let's close our eyes we'll have a word of prayer let's pray our most praise and the father in heaven we thank you for thy blessings o lord that you're best upon us creator, redeemer, and sustainer. We thank you for the privilege which you have given to us, Lord, especially on this um, Holy Sabbath day where we could gather at the presence and bringing glory, honor, and praises. We thank you for the privilege which you have given to us to come as a family, Father. O Lord, we are unworthy. We are sinners to call upon thy name. But you are always willing with unconditional love. And you take care of us despite in our sinful nature. And we don't acknowledge we thank thee, Father, for all the marvelous things. Especially, Father, this morning, this afternoon, I would like to pray about the service which is going on for the youth and for each and every one of us. We submit the young people into their keeping and caring hand. Take care of them, Father in all their ways of life as they prepare their selves in participating themselves in the ministry of God. Nurture them and use them effectively in thy vineyard, Father. Also pray for uh, the speaker of this hour. Especially pray for the sick Poor and the needy, O Lord. Especially people of uh, India, Philippines, in and around, as they are the huge surge in COVID cases. Take care of them, people, O Lord. We've been um, praying and listening where a lot of ministers and pastors and educationalists of our organization has been affected in those areas. Take care of them, Father. Be with the members too. Thank you for the commission which you have given to us as a church. Help all of us to be part of the commission, Father. Be with all the members, leaders, and pastors. We pray and remember about people who are suffering due to no water, food, and clothes, and shelter. Due to natural disasters, calamities, wars. Take care of them, Father. Pray and remember about this. Worldly leaders as they make decisions. You be with them, Father. You lead them. Thank you for the word which you have given to us. Thank you for the Sabbath school lesson. Help us to submit ourselves into the keeping and caring hands, O Lord. Moreover, Father, we ask thee for thy forgiveness from the sins which we are doing knowingly and unknowingly, Father. Help us to hear to that little call or voice of thee and to respond and to reconnect 
ourselves with thee, Father. Once again, we submit our lives into thy keeping and caring hands, O Lord. Give us this Sabbath blessings. And finally, O Lord, when sun comes in the clouds of heaven, may we all have a place in the eternal kingdom. For I ask these few blessings in the name of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be with you and to have this opportunity of, of sharing with you. Let me, uh, first of all, commend the, the youth team, commend Marla and everybody who has been involved in organizing um, these meetings and to have the courage to address the kinds of issues that we are looking at. Um, now, it's my responsibility today to look at the topic of identity. 
the title of the message is A Crisis of Identity. And I'm looking specifically at the area of um, gender identity and transgender. It's a very sensitive area. Now, um, this is going to be a message in two parts. So this afternoon, we will do more of a deep dive into the specific issues around gender identity, transgender, the political situation, and, and so much more. This morning, I'm going to be trying as much as possible to lay a, a biblical foundation and to look at how we came to be where we are today. So I'm going to go to screen, and we will address the issue of a crisis in identity. Let me begin where we should always begin, and that's in the Word of God. And we go right back to the beginning in the book of Genesis. And the Bible says there that we are created in God's image. Genesis 1.27 says, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created him male and female. He created them. Now, when God created mankind in his image, it was his intention that his image be passed on. First of all, between Adam and Eve, that they would reflect God's image to each other, and then they would reflect his image to their children, and their children would reflect his image to their children, and down through the generations, because it was God's intention that down through the generations, he would make himself and keep himself known. The primary mechanism he gave us for that was the family. But in general, all relationships were designed to, to, to witness to the character of God. Now, the Bible says in Genesis 2 and verse 17 that, that God gave Adam and Eve a warning. He placed a tree in the garden. Now, from my very human standpoint, this was a strange thing to do because it was me bearing in mind the, the, the potential disaster that was there should they mess with this tree. I, I would not have put the tree in the garden. And, and if I had to put the tree in the garden, I would have probably put a, a barbed wire fence around it and electrify it and put a force field around it. But God didn't do that. He places this tree in the garden and he allows Adam and Eve access to it, even though he warned them not to trouble it. He says to them in Genesis 2 and verse 17, in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Now, no, now the purpose of the tree was not to, to, to uh, tempt Adam and Eve. The tree was simply symbolic of a precious gift that God had given to Adam and Eve, and that gift was the gift of freedom. Because you cannot have a love relationship without freedom. The moment you remove uh, the freedom to, to leave or to walk away, you no longer have a love relationship. So God sets parameters within which Adam and Eve would live in harmony with his revealed will. Outside of his will, there would be suffering. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, the serpent enters the picture. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of the tree of every tree of the garden? And then after she replies to him and gives him the answer, he says, oh, you, shall, you, you shall not surely die. So what the serpent is doing here is questioning the authority of God. He, he, he begins his deceptive work with planting a seed of doubt in Eve's mind about the character of God. And, and his purpose was to challenge God's authority. Genesis 3 and verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And we see three elements here that we see replicated in, in John's letter. 
1 John 2 verse 16, John says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the eyes, the lust, or sort of rather, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. So we see here the tactics that the enemy applies. Uh, uses, what he appeals to in us in order to bring us down. And what we see here are the, the, the traits of sensualism, or we see materialism, and we see egotism. These are the tactics that the enemy used in the beginning. He has used down throughout time because they've always worked for him. And they actually represent some of the seeds of what we see in modern society that underpins decisions um, about, tra about embracing transgender ideology. And we'll unpack that as we go through. So Eve believed, when she made her decision, she believed that her decision was a rational reasonable calculation supported by what her feelings were telling her. And again, we see this replicated in the decisions that people make when they choose to identify themselves in ways that are other than God would desire. It seems rational, and it seems reasonable, and it is based uh, to a large extent on how they feel on the inside. Now, look at the dynamics that took place in the garden. The enemy influenced Eve to become dissatisfied with the way God created her. Somehow, he managed to get perfect Eve to feel that she was not good enough. I was reading one writer who suggested that, that, that even before sin took place, shame was at play because the, the, the basis of shame is that we do not feel that we are good enough. We don't feel that we are acceptable um, enough. And, and, and Eve gets to a point where she listens to the serpent and she decides that as she was, was not sufficient, that she needed something else in order to, uh, to reach to a higher level. The serpent said, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. He managed to convince her to compromise her perfection in the pursuit of something she already had. Because the Bible already said, that, that, that we read, that they were created in the image of God. They were already like God. Listen to the statement from Ellen White. She says in the Review and Herald, um, 1886, she says this, Eve believed the words of Satan and the belief of that falsehood in regard to the character of uh, God's character changed the condition and character of both herself and her husband. So, so she believes the lie and something changes. It wasn't God that changed, because the Bible says that, that God is the same today, yesterday, and forever. What changed was their perception about God, their understanding of what God's character was. And suddenly, they begin to see God in a different light. Eve goes to her husband. And the Bible says she also gave to her husband with her, and he Eight. And again, we see another dynamic here that plays out in modern society, because Adam made a conscious choice to substitute his judgment in the place of God's expressed will. So God comes looking for Adam and Eve. Adam, where are you? And Adam, in response, hiding behind that tree, says, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Adam and Eve, as a result of their transgression, begin to feel emotions they were never designed to experience. And yet now they're experiencing fear, they're experiencing shame, they're experiencing a whole gamut of emotions. Now, notice this. After Adam and Eve sin, the first result of their rejection of God is that Adam and Eve felt ashamed and awkward about their bodies. 
a departure from God's will for them resulted in awkwardness, a feeling of awkwardness about the bodies they inhabit. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. They cover themselves up. And again, we see here that without the covering of God's grace and truth, human beings will come up with their own ways to cover their sense of shame. So in Genesis chapter 3, what we see here is a casting off of God's rule, a casting off of God's authority. Now, when we cast off God's authority, under the principle that, you know, that nature cannot sustain a vacuum, if you get rid of God's authority, something has to occupy the space that his authority once did. We have to come up with another source of authority. In Genesis 3 and verse 11, when God questioned Adam, he asked him, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? In a sense, God is saying to Adam, who have you been listening to? And this is a question that it is particularly relevant to our topic today, because we have to ask ourselves, where is the authority coming from, from the, for the decisions that we make about ourselves? Because if they don't come from God, they're going to come from elsewhere. Now, every one of us has sources of authority that we rely on to make our choices. We are growing up in a world that, to a great extent, does not know and does not recognize God. And as a result, uh, many of the sources from which people make their decisions about themselves are coming from science. They're coming from friends and family. They're coming from social media. Maybe they're coming from uh, different uh, faith beliefs. Maybe they're coming from their political beliefs. They're coming from all types of places that don't necessarily recognize who God is or, or, or recognize his authority. Now, now the, the sources from which we gain our information, they develop within us a worldview. I was reading a book by, by a man called George Barner. Now, George Barner is a Christian researcher, and he has done extensive work about uh, regarding the church and what makes healthy families and what makes healthy um, church communities. And one of the things he focuses on is worldview. He makes the point that between the ages of zero to 14, this is the time where, where we develop the worldview that we will probably die with. So when it comes to raising our children, this is why it is so important that in the early formative years, we make sure that they develop a biblical worldview, because once they develop that and it becomes ingrained in them, it will probably stay with them for a lifetime. That's why Solomon says, train up a child in the way that he should go. When he is old, he will not depart from it. But if God is not the authority, the authority comes from somewhere else. And we develop a worldview. Now, everybody has a worldview. A worldview is a collection of attitudes, values, stories, and expectations about the world around us, which inform every thought and action. Our worldview comes to the surface whenever we need to decide uh, to live in some way. So if you are in any doubt about what your worldview is, don't necessarily look at the, the, the values that you espouse or that you claim to have. Look at the choices that you make, because they are the best indicator of what your worldview actually is. The worldviews that inform modern theories about gender identity have come about as a result of the merging of a variety of powerful cultural 
influences. I'll look at some of those uh, very, very quickly. Uh, relativism, for example, uh, that, that is the teaching that there are no absolutes, that truth is subjective. So you can have your biblical truth over there, but I have my truth, uh, and there is no, no absolutes. Then there is post-Christian. We are living in a society that is post-Christian. If we go back, say, say 30 years, 40 years, society was to a great extent influenced by Christian values. This is supposedly a Christian nature, a Christian nation. But yet Christianity has a declining influence within our culture. And we're living in a society where people are largely biblically illiterate. Then there was a sexual revolution, which began in the 60s. And what the sexual revolution did was to detach sex from marriage and procreation. Uh, with, with contraception, people were able to, to live their lives as they wanted to in terms of their sexual expression. Then there was feminism. And what feminism did uh, was to blur the gender distinctions. It was to... It, it, forwarded an argument that that women are just as good as men and, and can do uh, whatever they want and they're on an equal footing and it kind of blurred the distinctions between masculinity and femininity but now uh, experiencing a backlash because the the ground that feminism won is now to a great extent being uh, impinged on by by the transgender community and there is a, there is a war within the lgbt community uh, over these issues then there is individualism this is a movement from an emphasis on what is best for the community to an emphasis on what is best for the individual then there is dualism. Uh, this is an idea that the mind is 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 better than the body. That if there is a, a any kind of a dispute between the two or, or, or discrepancy between the two, then the mind is the, the the purer thing. And this is very much related to the next one, which is Gnosticism. Gnosticism is an ancient mystic uh, um, religion or mystic faith, which says that the body is bad, matter is bad. What's most important is what's on the inside. It's the inner self that gives us authenticity. And you can see how this relates very closely to transgender ideology, which says it's really not about your biology. It's about how you feel on the inside. And all of these different ideologies have converged to feed into transgender ideology. What we are seeing today in terms of the transgender movement and LGBT, which has moved so rapidly in the last few years, didn't come about by accident. There is a revolution that is happening in Western culture that is exploding our assumptions and traditions of what it means to be a man or a woman. The Bible says in Genesis 2, verse 21, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. The, the distinction between masculinity and femininity is God's idea. You know that passage, you know that passage that we often argue about um, in, 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 I believe it's in Deuteronomy about wearing trousers. Men shall not wear, or women shall not wear that that pertains to the man, and the man shall not wear that that pertains to the woman. And we get bogged down in these issues about, you know, whether or not we should wear trousers in church. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a really a ridiculous argument. Uh, for example, Moses wore what would closely, more closely relate to what women wear today. So the issue wasn't necessarily about the, the, the actual garment, but what God was trying to express in that passage was that there needs to be clear distinction between what is masculine and what is feminine. Because in today's society, it is the culture that defines what pertains to masculine and feminine. But God is saying that there needs to be this clear distinction. Society is seeking to wipe out that distinction. So coming back to our, our worldview, 
If you get rid of God's authority and you're not taking your authority from external to yourself, you become the authority. Me, myself, and I. Because who has more right to tell me how to live than me? Who knows me better than me? Who can I trust who wants what's best for me more than me? And so the standard for judging what is best becomes how we feel. But this is a particularly dangerous way to decide how to live your life. Let me tell you why. Uh, in his book, um, Could It Be the Simple, a biblical model for, for healing the mind, uh, Timothy Jennings comes up with this, this hierarchy of the mind. At the top of the hierarchy, the spiritual nature, which contains reason, reason which distinguishes us from the brute beasts, reason which is part of the image of God within us, the ability to make rational judgments, to, to evaluate. Couple that with the conscience, that the capacity we have to distinguish between right and wrong and then put that together with our worship experience and we have there a, the spiritual nature. This is where God wants us to be making our decisions. And what helps us to do that is the will. That is our power of choice, our thoughts, that is our beliefs, our morals, our, the imagination and underpinning that are our feelings. Now, God wants us to be making our decisions at the level of the spiritual nature, but the enemy wants us to be making our decisions on the basis of our feelings. And just how dangerous that is. Think about this for a moment. Think about the worst decisions that you have ever made in life. Now, did you make those decisions based upon a pros and cons exercise where you took a piece of paper and you put the cons on one side and the pros on the other and then made your decision? Did you make those decisions after consulting with wise counselors? Did you make those decisions after submitting it to, to God in prayer and then coming to a decision? Or did you make those decisions based upon your feelings? God never intended for our feelings to lead our decision-making process. Our feelings are important, but they must always be submitted to the higher power of the spiritual nature. The Bible says, Genesis, first text in the Bible, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This is probably the most important passage in this whole debate because it states two important factors. Number one, God is the creator. Number two, we are the created. Now, once we accept the premise that God is the creator and everything we are or and have belongs to him, then only he has the knowledge and the authority to tell us who we are and how we should live our lives. Not only the fact that he is our creator, but also on the basis of what he has done for us gives him the right to speak. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. We can trust him because not only is he our creator, but he is also our savior. Now, in Proverbs 3, verse 5, the Bible says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. Do not lean on your own understanding. Do not lean on your own uh, rationality, on your own feelings. This is what God is telling us. As Christians, we have a better source of authority, knowledge, and trust than our own feelings uh, and, and presumptions. God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. God uh, he made mankind according to his blueprint, and he knew what he was doing. So the best way for us to live is according to the blueprint that God put in place because he's the one that's designed us. A rejection of the blueprint is a rejection of God himself. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did 
what was right in his own eyes. And the principle that comes out of this is that where there is no authority, where there is no uh, um, a, a good authority, it results in anarchy. Because everybody chooses what's right for them. So the question of identity is a question of whether the creator has the right to speak about his creation. As our creator, he knows that our highest calling and our greatest pleasure is found in living in line with how he has designed us. Now it says in 1 Corinthians 6 verse 19 that you are not your own, for we are bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. We don't have the right to recreate ourselves as we choose, either by choosing how we're going to identify ourselves or by going under a, a surgeon's knife to, to recreate our physical bodies. We don't have that right because we don't belong to ourselves. We are simply stewards of the bodies that God has allowed us. So how should we respond? to those who are experiencing confusion about their gender. When we consider the transgender debate, we must never lose sight that the heart of the transgender debate are hurting people. Never lose sight of that. The Bible says of Jesus, a bruised reed he will not break. A smoking flax he will not quench. He will bring forth justice for truth. Gender dysphoria, this condition where, where individuals feel that their physical body is out of alignment with, with what they feel on the inside, is a horrible condition. It is a very real a psychological condition. It is a condition that brings pain and distress to those who go through it and to the families who support them. So understand that, that gender dysphoria is not a sin. While the contributing factors do vary from person to person, gender dysphoria is not a choice. Those who experience gender dysphoria, what they need from us is, is compassion. What they need from us is understanding. We need to avoid judgment. It is always easier to judge others for things with which we do not struggle while ignoring our own failings. And Jesus says, look, before you start trying to take that little, little splinter out of somebody's eye, you would deal with the, the log that is in your own eye. So when it comes to this whole area of, of transgender and, and gender identity, we must avoid judgmentalism. Paul says to us, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one, for all have sinned and come short of the glory. And let me repeat again that gen the gender dysphoria is not a sin. The sin comes in where individuals choose to embrace a transgender lifestyle that is in contrary to God's expressed will about gender. We all have a crisis of identity until we find our identity in the one who has created us. In Isaiah 43, 1, God said, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by my name. You are mine. So no matter how, 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 how uh, sinful we are, God still claims us as his own, and it is his claim to us that gives us our true identity in spite of our failings. And Jesus said in Luke 4, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. That includes those who struggle with gender dysphoria, those who struggle with, with transgender. 
Now, when Jesus left this planet, he passed on the baton to his disciples. And so this messianic mission becomes our mission too, that we are to become incarnational uh, to, to those who are suffering. In other words, we are to step into uh, their experience in order to provide them with relief. And Adam and Eve were bowed down in their sin. How did God relate to them? The Bible says, and in, in this is God speaking to the serpent. He said, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So in response to Adam and Eve's sin, what God does is, is to give them uh, what, what somebody has called the John 3.16 of the Old Testament. He gives them the promise of a savior to come. And not only that, the Bible says, and also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and skins and clothed them. He gave them protection and he gave them a promise. He didn't leave them. In the New Testament, Jesus, uh, Matthew says of Jesus, when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion because they were like weary and scattered. They were like weary and scattered, like sheep having no shepherd. Jesus' heart went out to those who were suffering. Now, here's the thing. It is said that the highest level of prejudice tends to correlate with the lowest level of contact. It is easy to hate and despise people from a distance. But when we get up close and personal, then it sparks empathy within our hearts and it sparks compassion within our hearts. The question is, are we willing to get up close and personal with those who are suffering? We serve a God who chose to make himself vulnerable in the sense that he was open to wounding to pain, rejection, and death. We serve a God who chose to enter into our experience in the form of his son, incarnational ministry, stepped into our world and our experience in order to save us. Philippians 2 and verse 7 says, God made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. Jesus knows. He knows the experience of those who are experiencing dysphoria. When Jesus took the sins of the world upon him, he took the sins of the world upon him. He knows what it means to suffer. Listen to what Ellen White says of Jesus in the book Desire of Ages. For 4,000 years, the race had been decreasing in strength physical strength, in mental power, and in moral worth. And Christ took upon him the infirmities of degenerate humanity. Only thus could he rescue uh, or heal man from the lowest depths of his degradation. Uh, Paul says in Hebrews, for in that he himself suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. Jesus knows and, and, and when he came to this planet, he, he took on human form. He can provide comfort because for our sakes, he chose to limit himself in a physical body that was incongruent with his divine identity. And as a result, he extends to us an invitation. He says, come to me, all you who, are, who labor and are heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn of me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. My hope and my prayer for us is that as we wrestle with the issues of, of, of gender identity, 
that we too will allow our hearts to be filled with compassion. That first off, we will accept or continue to accept Jesus' invitation to us. And as we allow him to heal our hearts, we will be prompted to reach out to those who suffer, those who, who are burdened with the struggles around the issues of gender identity. And I pray that God will soften our hearts, that we can be a help rather than a hindrance. So may God bless us to this end in Jesus' name. Let us bow our heads as we pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your word, the word that gives us encouragement, your word that gives us comfort and solace in our pain and in our struggles. We thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ, who has made it possible for us to experience release from the sins that so easily beset us. We pray, Father God, that you will be with every soul who is in the hearing of my voice, those who are struggling with various issues. There may be some who are struggling with gender identity. And I pray, Father God, that you will help them to understand that you love them. You love them more than life. And that if, if they were the only ones who ever sinned on this planet, Jesus would still have died for them. And so, Father God, I pray that you will place your loving arms around them to hold them to you, give them the assurance that you can give them the victory over every struggle they have. And I pray that you will be with us all, Father, and you will soften our hearts, because every one of us struggle with our identity in you. We pray, Father, that you will strengthen us not only forgive us for the sins that we have committed, but that you will free us from the power of sin. And then you will place this desire within our hearts to go out and make known unto others what a friend we have in Jesus. And so we thank you, Father God, for hearing our prayer in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Seems to be no way. He works in ways we cannot see. He will make a way for me. He will be my guide. Hold me closely to His side. With love and strength for each new day, He will make a
I'd like to thank Pastor Hockey very much Pleasure. for his presentation. I love the way it continues from last week. I <laughs> really, really appreciate it very much. Pleasure. And we look forward to having you this afternoon. And the link for this afternoon will be sent to you. It's different during the yes, it's different. So we'll send it to you during your break. Okay. All right. Thanks very much, and we look forward to our members coming back too for that time. So let us sort in what it was said to us, and as Marla mentioned earlier on. Please write down any questions you've got so that we can ask Pastor Hockey the relevant things for us to have an idea or to get answers so that we will not be confused. So